My name is Elizabeth James Perry, and I'm a member of the Aquinnah Wampanoag tribe. I uh, first started looking at the King Philip sash probably about 15 years ago. Um, I was really intrigued by this early textile. You know, it is obviously very old. It's obviously also really worn. Um, you can see where it was faded in areas. You could see that the cloth was stretched by being attached to something and being worn on a regular basis, so it's, it's much loved. And when I picked it up, it really struck me. It felt extremely familiar, and it momentarily felt like meeting a family member or an old friend. And so that really intrigued me. I had to find out a lot more about it, and so I did genealogical research, colonial war era research, tried to find the intersection of Colonel Keyes or any of the Keyes family members, and Wampanoag folks, um, Penacook folks, Pequacook folks, anybody in the regions where they were involved in wars, Lake George, um, and in the appropriate time period. I also tracked down trade cloth records. Kenny Hamilton provided me references he had copied from the Guerin Lejoie trade cloth records in Michigan. And um, the trader that refers to this type of cloth is talking about it around 1714. He's making a request for that to be shipped to the Northeast um, so that he can sell it to his native clients and he's really showing how particular native customers were. They were requesting this certain color cloth, certain color selvage edge, they wanted the worm line which is that wavy design you see at the end that's you know incorporated into the coloration of the sash and it's a lot of work actually. It's technically challenging to produce cloth like that and um, you know you can use resist dye paste and things like that. It's, it's tricky to do without having colors run um, especially in that time period. And so I think it was just so expensive to make that this is probably the only example that survived of, you know, what was maybe one or maybe a few runs of this particular style. So it's pretty amazing that it's lasted. Um, I think it has, the sash has a story to tell. The sash has taught me different lessons. One of the lessons that I took away from the research of the sash was the story of the Keyes family. Um, member that went up and took part in the Battle of Lovewell in western Maine, what's now Freiburg, Maine, on the Saco River. It's just east of Penacook territory, so this is Pequacook territory, on the Saco River, just east of Con Conawayu, which is Conway, New Hampshire. And it's a really tragic tale, I think, um, in that the uh, Native defenders met with the English um, that were ranging the forests, I think, looking to attack, uh, you know, tribal fighters, but also tribal communities. Um, they were looking to, I think, collect scalps and get bounties and get bounty land. Basically, it was about English expansion into native homelands. And so the native people actually outnumbered the English. And in typical native fashion, they held out prisoner tie cords as if to say, look, we can do this the easy way. We can just take you as captives. We'll use you as leverage, basically, to preserve our homelands, ransom you back. It's all good. Nobody has to die. Unfortunately, um, you know, the English, their culture was different. Their values were different. Their motivations were different. And um, there was, you know, a pretty bloody battle. Uh, the Pequacooks ended up moving and consolidating with other tribes to the west and the north, um, up into Canada, and of course that that land was eventually sp spread into by the newcomers. Um, it kind of makes me look at the sash in multiple ways and from multiple full perspectives. You know, I, I can look at it as a textile artist and admire the artistry of the hands. I can look at it as um, a beautiful and protective piece that was very em emblematic of the person's tribal identity and it was very protect protective with its red black and white coloration I can think of it as a belonging and I can think of it as the war trophy that it became um, I can think of that po momentary possibility in the woods with the prisoner tie cords and that extension of mercy and humanity when coexistence was a possibility and then I can think of the death afterwards um, and the domination and so I think about choices people have in different time periods, and I think we all have choices. And I think sometimes the choices that were made here in New England gained 
newcomers' territory, but at the cost of rejecting their own humanity.